For myself, uh, my work has been largely preoccupied with birth, sex, death, and the search for God, as I put it, I think, uh, 30 years ago uh, in some piece of writing or other. I mean, Stan is one of the most important independent filmmakers in the world. Imagine cinema as something that exists in the world that also includes Edgar Allan Poe. Sometimes it seems like a Brackish film goes by so fast that you don't really have time to react to it. Uh, my eyes are the poorest aspect of all my physiology and it is quite sensible and understandable that, that for those reasons and along those lines I have um, developed vision. While other artists experimented with cinematography, narrative, character, sound and so on, Stan Brakhage dealt with film itself, celluloid. Many theatres no longer project nitrate film due to its cost, and while digital can now match it in terms of quality, the soul of celluloid film has been lost to a degree. But for Brackage, celluloid film was more than a simple stepping stone in the process of creating and screening a film, but a medium to be explored in itself. I suppose as I go on representing this in ways that are available to me, which have across the years uh, encompassed uh, uh, baking film in the oven, ironing it, uh, photographing iron filings under magnetic and under vibrations using vibrations and powders, photographing brine shrimp herded into a small space to get the meat quivering sense of it, uh, and largely painting. His films function not only as streams of consciousness, but carefully edited snippets of his interior thoughts, a process he termed moving visual thinking. If science uh, comes up with a machine so you could tap into people's actual thinking process and then project whatever they're thinking as vision and put it up on a screen, I'm doing that laboriously by painting because we don't have any way to do that. His films, of which there are well over 300, typically contain no narrative, character, or even sound. In fact, the only element intended to be experienced outside of the frame was the whirring of the film projector. And uh, aesthetically speaking, it's just appalling to me to try to watch, for example, as I did, Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin on video. I mean, it, it, it dulls all the all the rep of, the, uh, of the, the, the edit. Video looks like a pudding that's virtually uh, un un uncuttable. But like any other experimental filmmaker, there was a very clear theoretical philosophy behind his works. Imagine an eye unruled by man-made laws of perspective. An eye unprejudiced by compositional logic an eye which does not respond to the name of everything, but which must know each object encountered in life through an adventure of perception. This was Brackage's notion of the untutored eye, and it was the core concept behind all of his films. How many colors are there in a field of grass to the crawling baby unaware of, quote, green, end quote? How many rainbows can light create for the untutored eye? How aware of variations in heat waves can that eye be? Imagine a world alive with incomprehensible objects and shimmering with an endless variety of movement and innumerable gradations of color. Imagine a world before the, quote, beginning was the word. But this idea was not unique to Brackage. Compare these two paintings. The first is Girl with a Pearl Earring by Vermeer, one of the most well-renowned European paintings ever made. The second is a reproduction of that painting by a child. I think most of us would agree that the first painting is a little bit better at portraying the intricacies of human expression than the second, and is thus a better work of art. 
but why exactly is this? After taking four tenths of a gram of the psychoactive drug mescaline, Aldous Huxley wrote in The Doors of Perception that visual impressions are greatly intensified and the eye recovers some of the perceptual innocence of childhood when the sensum is not immediately and automatically subordinated to the concept. Similarly, John Ruskin wrote in his book The Elements of Drawing that the whole technical power of painting depends on our recovery of what may be called the innocence of the eye. That is to say, of a sort of childish perception of these flat stains of colour, merely as such without consciousness of what they signify, as a blind man would see them if he were suddenly gifted with sight. Vermeer evidently understood and practiced these concepts. Ruskin's innocence of the eye, Huxley's perceptual innocence of childhood, and finally, Brackage's untutored eye, painting shapes, shades, and values without consciousness of what they signified. He processed the raw visual information that his eyes were gathering and transformed that into his art. Instead of building up from a series of generic assumptions about what a person looks like. On the other hand, the artist here has simply painted their perception of reality, rather than what is actually there. This copy is really a replication of the principal items in the painting. The face isn't painted as a whole, but has been distinctly broken down and categorized into different objects like the eyes, nose, and mouth. These objects reflect the artist's idea of what, say, an eye looks like, rather than what it actually is, a collection of shades, shapes, and values. As art historian Ernst Gombrich said, whenever we receive a visual impression, we react by docketing it, filing it, grouping it in one way or another, even if the impression is only that of an ink blot or a fingerprint. It is the business of the living organism to organize, for wherever there is life, there is not only hope, as the proverb says, but also fears, guesses, and expectations, which sort and model the incoming messages, testing and transforming and testing again. The innocent eye is a myth. This filing, grouping, categorization for brackage meant a form of simplification, a low resolution version of the true idea. But the untutored eye wasn't a purely positive experience, it simply reflected a precognitive state of vision. As such, Brackage's works not only drew attention to the flaws and limits of the celluloid film frame, but to entoptic phenomena or the physical flaws of the eye. These included floaters, little white specks in your field of vision, Purkinje trees, or reflections of the blood vessels in your eye, and most notably, phosphenes, the explosions of color you get when rubbing your eyes. The tutored eye intentionally ignores these flaws because, from a utilitarian perspective, they serve no purpose to vision. In the same way that film may be riddled with dust, scratches, and bumps, so too does the untutored eye have its flaws but for Brackage, they were an unalienable part of the experience. Stan Brackage rejected all forms of dichotomy and categorization. This painting represents the essence of the tutored eye, what Brackage actively attempted to deconstruct through his films. He found any type of categorization a form of restriction and simplification, and rejected it on all levels. Uh, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll have things that might be nameable, like you might say this is a landscape. Here the landscape is in this form of upheaval, and, and, and here, are, here are the little rose that's growing upon it, being lifted up into the air, whatever. I mean, you can say things about it, but at least it's obvious that it resists that kind of usage. I have examples that resist it very much better. As a matter of fact, the reason that this hunk is framed and doesn't exist within the Dante Quartet, which is what it was originally made for, and it is it's an outtake because it, it's, it's too close to the nameable. It's too coherent in the normal old ways of uh, painting. His films can be seen to categorically reject categorization, with nearly every element sitting in a form of filmic purgatory. In the world of the unshooted eye, definition cannot exist because there is no separation, no boundaries to define. It is the pre-linguistic utopia of the tabula rasa, the world before the beginning was the word, the blank slate in which there is no conscious filter. Gombrich is right in that the innocent eye is a myth and we cannot ever regain this state, but Brackage's works allow us to revisit it, if not just for a moment.